Welcome to Think Like a Nurse, the video outreach of Keith RN. Today's topic, how to practically transform nursing education. Today, I will practically demonstrate how you can flip your classroom and make it an active learning environment by using my sepsis rapid reasoning activity that is currently a free download on my website, Keith RN. I also have this PowerPoint and the concepts as a link here on this YouTube video. Now, rapid reasoning is a brief case study that has a clinical scenario with 10 open-ended clinical reasoning questions that promote nurse thinking. I currently have 36 other med search topics available for a small fee to serve your needs in the classroom. Through this demonstration on sepsis, I will show how I have practically implemented the changes that Benner advocates are needed to transform nursing education in the classroom by decreasing content, emphasizing concepts, integrating content to the clinical context, and provide opportunities to practice nurse thinking through an emphasis of clinical reasoning. So let's take the plunge and transform nursing education together. All right, today's topic is sepsis. And let's talk first about some key concepts related to sepsis that are gonna really help us understand what is relevant and need to know with this essential topic that you will see repeatedly in clinical practice. First, let's do a sepsis overview. Sepsis has almost 1 million cases annually in the United States today. It is actually a larger reason for readmissions than heart failure, which has been number one for years. There's 500 deaths a day attributed to sepsis with an increase in the population. As the population ages, we're gonna see more sepsis and the mortality rate is huge, 23 to 50%, depending on severity and when it is caught in the cascade. Let's look at who's at risk. There's two populations that are at highest risk for developing sepsis, septic shock, and death. First, it's the extremes of age. It's those that are less than a year of age in the pediatric population and specifically less than two months of age because of immature immune systems. And secondly, that we'll see more commonly in the, in the clinical setting is the adults over the age of 65, especially those with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and heart failure. Those that are susceptible hosts such as uh, ETOH abuse and being malnourished is going to increase your likelihood. Anytime we do an invasive or surgical procedure, that obviously increases our risk for any post-op patient, as well as if they have a history of immunosuppression related to either prednisone or even an oncology patient with chemo and radiation. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of sepsis. We need to understand this so that we can really understand what is going on at the physiologic level with any patient who experiences sepsis. First, we need to understand that it is an activation of the inflammatory response. It is a cascade that starts with inflammation. And what we have with that cascade is increased capillary permeability with third spacing and vasodilation. And what is that going to cause in your patient's vital signs? Obviously, we're going to see blood pressure decrease, but first we'll see the compensatory mechanism of the heart rate increase. We're gonna see that third spacing, we're gonna see decreased venous return, which is a reflection of decreased preload, decreased cardiac output, and therefore decreased tissue perfusion. Let's talk about shock, and this is true for septic shock or any shock state, hypovolemic, uh, cardiogenic. Shock is essentially a perfusion to the cells that is inadequate to deliver oxygenation and nutrients to support vital organs and cellular function. Let's talk then about the common themes that we see with any shock state. So this is true for any, this is a key concept that is situated here with sepsis, but is also reflected in septic shock. We have a hypoperfusion of the tissues. There is a lack of oxygenation to the tissues. We have the activation of the inflammatory response, and this is relevant when we, when we talk about SIRS, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. We have with that sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So let's talk about how is that going to affect the body physiologically with fight and flight. Obviously, we're gonna see the heart rate elevate. We're going to see initially blood pressure elevate and go from there. We're also going to see again that inflammatory cascade. So let's talk about the stages of shock and, co and contextualize that. We have the first stage is compensatory where we see the blood pressure is actually normal. 
This is where sepsis is hidden, but they are tachycardic. The question is, any tachycardia without a reason is always a clinical red flag. If that patient is not in pain, does not have a fever, that patient with a heart rate greater than 90 to 95, if that's not their baseline, the nurse must state why. Secondly, they have sympathetic nervous system stimulation with this, and again, their blood pressure will actually might even be a little bit on the elevated side. But then as shock continues, it goes into a progressive state. And now, with all of the vasodilation, the loss of preload, the decreased cardiac output, now we're sliding into septic shock. They are now hypotensive. Their systolic blood pressure is trending lower, as well as progressing to an irreversible shock state, which is now we have multiple organs involved. The renal system is now impacted, the neurologic system, the cardiovascular, even respiratory. This patient is getting closer and closer to death. Question is, when do you want to recognize sepsis? When it's in compensatory shock or when they are in irreversible shock? question is obvious. We as nurses must rescue our patients when they are in the compensatory stage, when we can still rescue them effectively. Let's talk about essential labs to trend and why. With any, with any lab value, we must trend every value relevant to sepsis. If they are at risk, based on what we talked about with who's at risk. So let's look at our complete blood cell count. We must always look at our white blood cell count, especially the neutrophils, and how are those trending? Because the neutrophils are your first responders and the most dominant leukocyte of the white blood cells. Therefore, if there is an infectious process, your body was created to go after it and is going to elevate that percentage. Usually greater than 85% is significant. What are bands? Well, bands are immature neutrophils, should be less than 10%. If those bands are elevated greater than 10%, your body is saying there is a problem and is going to go after that infectious origin and sending out immature neutrophils before they are ready. Let's look at our basic metabolic panel and look at about three essential electrolytes. First is potassium. Potassium is always relevant with our patients because of its relevance to cardiac electrical conduction. But more importantly, if there is renal uh, impairment involved in our sepsis, we are going to see our potassiums start to increase as our renal function decreases. And our creatinins are the most, are, are what I consider the gold standard of renal perfusion and function. We must trend the creatinine and see is that trending upwards. If it is, we have a problem. As well as looking at our CO2 or bicarbonate in our basic metabolic because that reflects acidosis. If that is beginning to go low, we know that we are in an acidotic state. We also need to look at our liver function test if they're done. ALT, ASTs are a reflection of liver function or an enzyme secreted by the liver. If they're trending upwards in sepsis or septic shock or any shock state, they are reflecting hypoperfusion to the liver. Therefore, that's a problem just as we see with the kidneys. But really the most relevant lab in sepsis is lactate. We need to go back and say, what is lactate? Well, lactate is a, is, is, is a reflection of lactic acidosis. Now we have to go back to pathophysiology, Krebs cycle, anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid. Therefore, whenever we have a hypoperfusion to the tissues, our lactates will elevate. Less than two is normal. If we're trending greater than two, we are increasing our likelihood of sepsis and septic shock. Let's talk about, again, the importance of lactate. Again, it's ref what's important to know is that the higher the lactate, when we identify it, the higher their likelihood of death. So, for example, if they are two to four, they have a 9% chance of dying. If that lactate is greater than four, they now have a 28% chance of dying. Therefore, that relevance is a key marker and indicator of the progression of sepsis. I also want to talk about interpreting a, ur a, a urinalysis. We as nurses must know how do we practically interpret all of the multitude of values on a typical UA. Well, there are three labs on that UA panel that we must note so we can make a judgment, is this person have a UT 
UTI, and urosepsis is one of the most common reasons of sepsis with the elderly. The most gold standard on a UA is the micro white blood cell count. If that is greater than five and symptomatic, most clinicians will diagnose that as a urinary infection. They also look at the nitrates. Nitrates are positive when there is E. coli or gram-negative bacilli metabolism present in the urinary system. It should be negative. The other one is leukocytesterase, either positive or negative. Normal is negative. It will be positive when there is white blood cells present in the urine. It is usually going to correlate with a greater than five white blood cell count on the micro, but not always. Let's look at red flags for sepsis. We need to understand what are SIRS and SIRS criteria. The reason this is relevant and you must memorize this in practice is that it is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. This is how we identify sepsis. Not by just a gut feeling, but if we look at these markers, we can identify that sepsis is present and we must recognize it to rescue our patient. First flag, temperature greater than 100.4 or less than 96.5. Again, hypothermia is not uncommon with the elderly because of their, uh, because of their immune system being somewhat worn out and not as active. Two, a heart rate greater than 90, clinically relevant for SIRS. Three, respiratory rate greater than 20. And a fourth, white cells greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. And fifth, bands greater than 10%. Other red flags you must recognize in the clinical setting and also involve is their hypotension present. If they're trending less than 20 millimeters on their systolic blood pressure from their prior or they're less than 90, clinical red flags you must ask why. We also look at urine output. Our gold standard is 30 mLs an hour. If they're starting to slide less than that, that's again a reflection of renal function and renal perfusion. We also look at decreased capillary refill. We look at the change in level of consciousness, new onset of confusion, as well as a creatinine that is beginning to trend. So when we look at medical management priorities, the most important piece is early identification. We must trend all relevant data of the temperature, heart rate, blood pressure in order to catch sepsis and recognize SIRS early. New onset and confusion is also a red flag. We must recognize and ask why. Trending the labs of white blood cells, Lactate, neutrophils, and creatinine are foundational to practice. We also need to recognize the value of fluid replacement. Again, lack of preload, we need to tank them up again. So therefore, we need to give volume and lots of it. It's not uncommon to give two or three liters of 0.9 NS in a patient who is beginning to slide into sepsis and septic shock. We also need to aggressively get them IV antibiotics. If we can identify sepsis in the first six hours, we can basically cut it in its tracks and we can rescue our patients effectively. If they do not respond to the two to three liters of fluids, typically that patient's gonna need vasopressors such as levofed or neosinephrine and they need to go to ICU. So this is the content of sepsis. Now let's situate this with a clinical reasoning, rapid reasoning activity.